very much and thanks very much for the intro. Um, well, I've been billed for this event as being from the UK, EU, Europe, although in truth I've actually been living in Australia for more than 18 months, working here in Melbourne at the Swinburne Institute for Social Research. But I think I got this billing because I was told that being from the UK, EU would be more exotic than plain old AU. Now, while 18 months isn't actually that long at all, I've been around here for long enough to notice um, that people here are looking a lot of the time to developments in the US, UK, rest of Europe for comparisons on a number of similar legal policy and social issues, including relating to technology, which are going on here. Funnily enough though, as I found during my time here, in the context of these comparisons, Europe actually is a pretty exotic place from an Australian perspective and vice versa when it comes to privacy and its legal protection, as we've just been hearing perhaps on the right to be forgotten. Now in Europe for some time, privacy has had the status of a fundamental right and can be found in uh, documents such as the European Convention on Human Rights, a treaty to which all European countries, excluding Belarus, but including Russia, Turkey, and for the moment the UK, are signatories. The European Union is actually, uh, legally speaking, a totally separate institution, but the two are often confused, including in a recent misjudged, kind of virulently europhobic and swiftly deleted tweet from one of a British Conservative Party Twitter account, which is quite funny to read if you can still see it. But in any event, the EU has had a pretty robust data privacy laws for almost 20 years, and for the last five years has, a, has had a charter of fundamental rights, which includes the right to privacy and a separate right to data protection. So far, so dry and legal. But I would say that this formal enshrinement of privacy in Europe is actually exotic from an Australian perspective, given there is no constitutional right to privacy in Australia and no ability to strike down federal laws for their incompatibility with, with citizens' privacy. Although, to be fair, there is a weak form of data protection in the Privacy Act. Now, I think there are some important lessons from Europe as to how these privacy protections have worked out in practice, which have resulted in some recent big privacy victories for citizens. And I think these lessons from Europe are important here, giving laws currently under consideration in Australia, which are very similar to some discredited European laws that have been struck down for failing to protect citizens' privacy adequately. So what I thought I'd do with my time here is talk about some of these recent privacy developments in Europe and how they're instructive for current debates. Firstly, data retention. Now this is shaping up to be one of the main topics for discussion here at today's conference and indeed opposition to data retention proposals in Australia seem finally to be gaining some ground in the media and politics, particularly in the last week. The EU can offer us an important privacy lesson on this topic from its own data retention scheme which was set up in 2006. These laws in Europe required that operators of electronic communication services and networks had to retain the data generated by all users of these services and networks for a period of time between six months and two years. Now, the kind of data that they had to keep included things like telephone numbers, uh, the names and addresses of account holders and recipients, IP addresses and location data, but not information about the content of the communications, i.e. metadata. And the stated purpose of this scheme was that the information was to be available for the investigation, detection and prosecution of serious crime. Now for quite some time in Europe there's been concerns about the data retention scheme being far too intrusive of European citizens' privacy, the vast majority of whom were completely law-abiding and not engaged in any way in serious crime. In fact, over the last few years, there have been various constitutional challenges to the scheme in the national courts of EU member states, and I believe in all cases the data retention laws were found to be unconstitutional. But it wasn't until earlier this year that a challenge from the advocacy NGO Digital Rights Ireland and various privacy campaigners from Austria reached the EU's Court of Justice. And these groups argued that the rules were disproportionate and unnecessary to achieve the aim of ensuring data was available for the purposes of fighting serious crime and that the rules were incompatible with the rights to privacy, data protection and free expression. Now, the European um, Court of Justice struck down the law in validating it, finding that the retention of data, although it satisfied an objective of general interest, the fight against crime, the rules went beyond what was strictly necessary to achieve this goal. 
the court seemed to be particularly concerned about the blanket as opposed to targeted nature of the surveillance and even stated that the rules were an interference with the fundamental rights of practically the entire European population, with the vast majority of these people not being even indirectly in a situation which is liable to give rise to criminal prosecutions. There was also some serious concerns around the lack of limitation on the access of this data by national authorities and their subsequent use. And for instance, there was no limitation that the, this data was to be accessed and used only for the purposes of fighting serious crime. Now, despite the EU court's pretty damning indictment of the data retention scheme, scheme, particularly from a privacy perspective, it seems that the Australian government here is keen to press ahead with similar laws. And unfortunately, the government here is able to do so legally speaking, given the lack of privacy protection at a robust constitutional level. And at the same time, ironically enough, the government seems to be deluding itself into thinking that data retention is the way Western countries are going, when the opposite seems to be true in practice, at least from a European perspective. Now, it might be worthwhile mentioning briefly here while I'm on this point that for the time being at least, the UK, my home country, is an EU member and must comply with the European Court's decision on data retention and other matters. However, its own response to this decision has to be to cling obstinately to data retention, passing emergency legislation recently to introduce it. Now, this has been widely reported on in Australia and taken as a sign that data retention is not dead, including in the context of Australian political and governmental discussions. However, in my view, this is at best a garbled understanding of the UK situation. The reintroduction of data retention in the UK has been done in a way which still implements blanket surveillance and doesn't address the European Court's concerns. Furthermore, it's currently under challenge as well for not sufficiently protecting individuals' privacy rights and may well be found to be incompatible and a breach of EU law. The UK's conduct here can hardly be taken as a strong example of the legitimacy of blanket data retention schemes. Now, another area in which Australia seems to be determinedly following privacy infringing paths largely abandoned elsewhere is an online copyright infringement. Now, there are about a million things wrong with the Australian government's recent proposals concerning the egregious, civilization-threatening problem of illicit file sharing. But there's also scope here for another privacy lesson from Europe on this point. Now, it's far from clear from the discussion paper that the Attorney General's Department circulated in the last few months what precise steps the government might take to address this issue. However, the possibility of forcing internet service providers to monitor all of their users' conduct all of the time to detect the slightest possible copyright infringement does not seem to be, have been discounted. However, the EU's Court of Justice also does not seem to have much truck with the blanket surveillance of internet users for the purposes of de detecting copyright infringement as well as the purposes of fighting serious crime, although I'm sure there are plenty of people that will argue that the two are one and the same. In 2012, the, sorry, 2011, the court found that internet service providers could not be forced to engage in the total monitoring of their users' activity, and, they em and it emphasised as well that intellectual property rights were not absolute rights, but had to be balanced against other rights, such as internet users, freedom of expression and privacy. And this was reinforced a few months later in 2012, when the court found that a similar broad monitoring obligation could not be imposed upon social networks to prevent and detect their users' copyright infringements. Now, while the user interest in its entirety seems to be badly represented so far in the Australian government's initial proposals in this area, the European lesson here would be that their privacy should not be sacrificed at the altar of the copyright gods at all costs. Finally, and thirdly, perhaps a more cautionary tale from Europe. This is my view anyway on the right to be forgotten decision from earlier this year, which as we have been hearing definitely has a high profile, much more so arguably than copyright, the copyright or data retention decisions I've just been talking about, with a great degree of debate and intrigue regarding precisely what the right to be forgotten is, how it operates, and of course how it signals the death of free speech in Europe, the ends of the internet, and so on and so forth, as we were kind of hearing from the previous speaker. However, the decision itself has oft been garbled and distorted in its telling and is perhaps not quite as earth-shattering as it may appear at first blush. Now, the previous speaker gave some information about the details of the decision, the Spanish citizen lodging a complaint against the Spanish newspaper, the National Data Protection Agency and Google. This was actually regarding a notice of an auction of his repossessed home, which appeared in Google search results where a search was done for him. Now, apparently, he had paid, this had happened some years ago, he had paid 
off his debt that the repossession related to, and I believe that he was having problems in his professional life because this result kept on appearing, even though it was about something which had kind of been and gone, arguably. Um, so what happened in this decision and what it often, uh, often gets garbled here is that in this case the European Court did find that he had the right to request that the search remove, engine remove its links, links about this case uh, when his name came up in a search. But this decision is subject to conditions. Um, to be fair, the previous speaker did mention some of the, these conditions. The information at issue must be inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant or excessive. But also, the right to be forgotten is not absolute and must be balanced against other fundamental rights, such as freedom of expression and freedom of the media. In practice, this requires each case to be looked at individually on its merits, and consideration needs to be made of the type of information in question, its sensitivity for an individual's private life, and the public interest in assessing that information. In this case at hand, the court found that the interference with the Spanish man's right to data protection could not be justified by Google's economic interest. Now, although there's been a lot of fuss around it, this conception of the right to be forgotten, or its popular title, is not entirely novel and is based on the right to deletion, which is contained within the EU's data protection law for some time, which entails that a person can ask for personal data to be deleted when that data is no longer necessary. And it also should be remembered, too, that Google has been removing links prior to this decision in response to, for instance, Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown requests and claims of defamation. Now, I do admit that any privacy lesson which should be drawn here should be more cautionary than the copyright monitoring and data retention cases, and this is why I, this is why I think this should be the case. Now, in principle, a situation such as that with the Spanish citizen who brought the case is delicate, where there are evidently competing rights, or if you prefer the term, interests. One interest may be in his privacy or, and or ability to move on with his life balanced against the public's interest or right to know and receive information. Personally, in this case, I think the court did not too bad a job of balancing these interests, but my concern here lies more in who will make this judgment in the future. It seems that it is the private companies providing these services which are the first port of call rather than the court, and their ability to strike that delicate balance between different societal interests may be overshadowed, for instance, by their risk and litigation averse nature. This might result in them, for instance, removing all links when they request, just in case, and so the right to be forgotten in this sense may have a chilling effect on legitimate free expression. And indeed, Google's track record so far in the wake of this case is not very good when it comes to dealing with right to be forgotten requests. It seems to be removing too many links which should not fulfill the European Court's conditions and actually has been recused of overreacting to the decision. There's plenty more to say about the European experience of privacy, and there are actually some interesting cases to look out for in the UK and before the European Court of Human Rights regarding the UK's participation in the Five Eyes Mass Surveillance Partnership. But I think I'll leave it there at the moment and come to my conclusion. Now, I see the major lesson that these three cases from Europe provides for us in Australia is that individuals' privacy is important and can be protected in the face of the fight against serious crime and implicitly the war on terror, copyright maximalism and the economic interests of large corporations. But it seems at the moment, and also the exotic thing about these European cases from Australia, is that not only would these outcomes be unlikely in similar scenarios in Australia, but that on data retention and copyright, the Australian government seems to be actively pursuing paths that have been discredited in Europe. Now, I know there's been discussion here about introducing a tort or civil wrong for invasions of privacy. But in my view, and looking at the European lessons, this would not go far enough to protect individuals from government and corporate interferences with privacy and other rights. And so, to conclude, instead I would advance the proposition that Australia comes into line with some similar jurisdictions, such as those in Europe, and creates a strong constitutional right to privacy, which hopefully would act as a deterrent to bad laws being enacted in the first place, but would also be able to invalidate dangerous laws, even if they're passed. Thank you.